Our sermon text this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you would turn there. And I brought something with me today that might be of interest to some. And I asked Tice about this. I, uh, I came across this uh, kind of an insert at crosswalk.com which has some good things on it from time to time. And this is Psalms to Pray for Deliverance. And there are 15 of them from the Psalms. And they're anywhere from a sentence to three or four verses. Uh, Praying to God as your shield, praying for God's comfort and love, praying for God's refuge, praying for healing and freedom. And I made copies of this and put it on a table back there in the back. And if you'd like to have one of these, you certainly can take one and uh, put it in your Bible or put it by your nightstand. And uh, over months' time, you can pray through two or three of these verses, um, and that might be of encouragement to you. So if the message today isn't any good, you can have something to take with you, (laughs) and I brought that for you. This, this, these have been weeks of reflection for me. Two weeks ago, our children, John and Angie and David, took us to Estes Park for four nights, four days, five days, I guess, uh, to help us celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary, which isn't really till December. But we decided to go together when we could all get free, no school, no interference. And it was absolutely wonderful. We just sat on the deck looking over the mountain, uh, telling memories, telling stories. Uh, It was just a wonderful time. Two days after we were back to our homes, I said to the kids, I'm still grinning ear from ear. That was such a blessing for me to think through what God has done to our marriage, to our family, to our lives over these years. First of this week, Jane and I were able to attend uh, just a small portion of the Brian Fellowship Connect Conference. Um, And that brought back memories to me. For almost 20 years ago, I moved from 20 years of uh, ministry in the St. Louis area to a place called Broken Bow, Nebraska. (laughs) Didn't know too much about it. Came here and found some wonderful Christian people who have been such a blessing and encouragement to Jane and me along the way. We just fit in and were extremely blessed. Also, I got to know the Berean Fellowship a bit. One of my first contacts from outside this church was Kurt Lehman and his wife, Claudine. They met us for lunch in Lincoln and kind of listened to our story and talked with us, encouraged us. That was a good thing. And then also, of course, I got to know, or got to know of, Brian Clark and his good ministry at the Brian Church in Broken Bow for probably more than 10 years. And uh, Brian spoke at the Connect Conference And my heart was so blessed by what he had to say to me, to all of us. It's just been a week of reflection. I tell people that I used to say, the years fly by so fast. And now I say the decades fly by so fast. Here I am in my eighth decade. And God has been very faithful. 
I'd ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 21, because I'd like for us to think together about God's assignment for his children, for each one of us. What does God desire that I do when I leave this place in an hour and go back to my work, my neighborhood, my friends, the things that are on my plate or agenda? What does God want to do in me and through me? The uh, book of Second Corinthians, of course, is written after First Corinthians. You know that. First Corinthians is written by the Apostle Paul to a church that is going through huge trouble, huge problems. In fact, if you look at the chapters in 1 Corinthians 15, you can see as many problems as there are chapters. These things were about to tear the church apart. So Paul writes the first letter to the church at Corinth and addresses those problems. He then writes 2 Corinthians. And where 1 Corinthians is kind of a, a picture of the state of the church, 2 Corinthians is a picture of the heart of the Apostle Paul the heart of a shepherd, the heart of one who's pouring his life into these believers in the city of Corinth. And uh, though we're not going through the entire book of 2 Corinthians, he uses these four, first five, chap five chapters to explain his ministry. The first chapter is about suffering but not defeat. The second chapter is about sorrowing, but not despairing. The third chapter is about spiritual and not carnal or fleshly. The fourth chapter is sincere, but not deceitful. The fifth chapter is serious, but not careless. And as he comes to the end of the fifth chapter, he comes to a paragraph of scripture that we're going to look at today and point out four things that he wants us to know about. This is the heart of the Apostle Paul. This is the shepherd's heart. And he says in verse 18, this ministry comes from God. He said, now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. By the way, I should tell you that if you're using one of the pew Bibles in front of you, this is on page 966. If you need a Bible, you can take that Bible with you. If you know somebody who needs it, you can hand it off to them. Paul's ministry comes from God. It begins with God. What a tremendous ministry it is. It's what God calls each of us to do who know Jesus Christ. This is why he left us in the world. This is why he hasn't taken us to heaven yet. There's something that needs to be done. And you and I can do it. It's not just the ministry of the Apostle Paul. 
it's not just an apostle's ministry. It's not just a pastor's ministry. This is ministry that is given to each one of us. This is our ministry. Now you can go through the entire New Testament and Old Testament and find things that God wants us to learn and know and do and program into our lives. I'm not saying that this is exclusive. But this does tell us something very important that God has picked us to do. It is our ministry. He uses the words we and us all through the passage. So we're going to look at these things. First of all, the ministry comes to us from God himself. It originates with him. It begins with God. He sent us and commissioned us as he commissioned Paul. Paul makes clear that God reconciles us first so that we can go and be involved in that process with other people. We go with what we ourselves have experienced. That helps a lot. You are the greatest authority on what God has brought about in your life. The message of reconciliation. That's something that begins with God. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and said, here, Larry, I want you to have the ministry of reconciliation. What does that look like? What would it be? The second thing that he says is this assignment is very powerful. It's very powerful. This is the message above all else that the world needs to know. You see, the problem with people everywhere is they have no security. They have no acceptance, no sense of worth. The universal problem of our day is poor self-image. Everybody's trying to do something about what they look like. I heard a story not long ago about a man who was walking through a grocery store. Could have been in Broken Bow, I suppose. But as he was doing a little minor shopping, he heard the awfulest commotion. It sounded serious. So he walked around to the aisle next to him where he thought the sound was coming from. And there down at the end of the aisle, he could see that somebody in their cart had run into part of the grocery aisle and had knocked over about everything that could be seen. Jars were broken, things were ruined, and there was a little lady who was on her knees back there trying her best to pick up what had fallen and as best as she knew how, try to put it back in place. The other people in that aisle were just kind of standing and looking at her watching her, seeing what she was going to do next. Well, the man who heard this and went around the aisle walked up beside the, the elderly lady and got down on his knees and decided to help her pick the stuff up and figure out where it came from and put it back in its place. And pretty soon the manager showed up a couple of minutes later, and the lady was embarrassed. She said, I, I, I don't, I can't explain how this happened, but it's my fault, and I'm doing the best I can to get things in their proper place. And the manager said, you don't have to do that. 
He said, well, I feel like I do. I feel like I need to clean up my own mess here. And he said, no, you don't need to do that. That's covered by insurance. The insurance will take care of it. You don't need to worry about it. Now think about this. In your life, in the lives of the people that you know, they're spending a bit of their time trying to clean up their own mess, trying to fix things that have gone wrong, and they can do little or nothing about it, but they're working at it. But Jesus has taken care of it. Every piece of brokenness, everything that has fallen apart, everything that's out of place, Jesus laid down his life for sinners. And he has provided all that's needed to put your life back in order. It is powerful. It is life-changing. Some of you, I suspect, have a story, a testimony. And if we could go back far enough in your own testimony, you could say, I was in a hopeless situation. I was trying to fix my life, and I couldn't do it. And then somebody told me about Jesus who paid the price, who took care of everything. And if I would stop trying and start trusting him as my Savior, I would become a child of God. And some of you have that story exactly. I didn't know what I was going to do. My life seemed hopeless. I didn't know where to turn. But somebody told me about Jesus, who paid the price for my sin, so I wouldn't have to pay it. That message is powerful. It is life-changing. Some of you are testimonies to that very thing this morning. God changed you when you thought you were hopeless. That doesn't mean you've got everything perfect, but you do have that thing perfect. You're trusting in the thing God said you need to trust in. And that's the finished work of Christ on the cross. It is so powerful. This message requires a voluntary acceptance. For verse 20 says, So we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We beseech you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. An ambassador is a representative of a country. He's in a very important position. You and I are ambassadors for Christ. He is making an appeal through us. And the text says, we beseech you on behalf of Christ. My text has the word you in italics, which means it really doesn't belong there because Paul is writing to believers who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. So he's not beseeching them to be reconciled to Christ. They have made that decision. Maybe it was two years ago. Maybe it was decades ago, like myself. 
we beseech on the half, behalf of Christ to be reconciled from God to God. Dr. Lewis Ferry Chafer, one of the founders of Dallas Seminary, tells it in a story like this. When God created Adam and Eve, he loved them. They were his creation. And Adam and Eve decided to sin, to disobey God, so they turned their backs on God and he had no choice but to turn his back on them because of their sinfulness, the sinful choices they were making. Isaiah says it this way, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But the Savior, the Lord Jesus, turned back towards every person, every man, and beckons this person to be reconciled to God, to turn to Christ, the only provision, so that that beautiful relationship can be intact forever and ever. The message requires a voluntary acceptance. The fourth thing is this testimony achieves the righteousness of God. For our sake, God made him, that is Christ, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The more I think about that, the more I can't get over it. That the perfect Son of God, the Holy One, the Sinless One, took my sin upon his shoulders. The Bible says he became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Who of us deserves that? Why would Jesus take my life when I'm trying to put everything back together and get it back on the shelf and as soon as I get something up there, something else falls down, I can't do it? Why would he do that? That's grace. I'm not worthy. You're not worthy. If you're listening to me on the radio today, you're not worthy. You're as unworthy as I was when I turned back to God. Years ago, probably when I was a kid, I remember a song that was often sung in churches those days. based upon the parable of the one lost sheep that the shepherd went out to find. One verse in particular that stuck in my mind ever since goes like this. None of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night which the Lord went through ere he found his sheep that was lost. We can't imagine that. And yet he did so. He did so. I haven't had an assignment with IPM for 10 months. I may have one next month, not sure. I've been living in our home and enjoying the Berean Bible Church. One of the things we've been enjoying 
is a life group that we were invited to attend on Wednesday nights. Twelve people or more that met and were considering the importance of this message, the reconciliation, the engagement project, the people that are within arm, arm reach of us, that God placed us next to them. Oh, they're so different from me. They're sinful people. I can hardly stand to be around that man. And yet God in his mercy and grace caused me to live next door to that person. Why do you suppose that was? God anticipated that I could be one who would make him aware of the life-changing ministry of reconciliation. Oh, but I don't... I can't stand that guy. And Jesus says, I know you can't. But I've placed you there. Now some of you uh, would say you're off the hook because you don't have anybody that lives within three miles of you. you know? <laughs> but the person that you know because of your children or the person that you have contact with. And you avoid them as best you can. And God in his providence has placed you alongside. Well, what are you going to do? Going to hammer him with scripture? Well, I hope not. But I hope you're going to come to listen to him or her. And see the thing they're dealing with. Because some of you were in their position some time ago. And you were reconciled to God. And God has given you this assignment for your neighbor, for your acquaintance, for the person who's really even not yet your friend. So I say, probably the first thing a person can do in that situation is to begin to pray for that person. And in the months that I've been with this group of, of 12 couples, and as much as we've shared our story with one another about this very subject, I have begun to pray for my neighbors like never before. Because I believe God answers prayer. And he's maybe going to give the, me the opportunity to come alongside of them and listen to them and say, I know exactly what you're going through. Jesus bore your sin in his own body on the cross so that you wouldn't have to try to pick all that stuff up and put it back in. A, let's see, where does that go? Oh, over here, I don't know. No. That's the assignment he's given to us. I read a story not too long ago. which is a story that comes out of April 14th, 1912, when the Titanic sank in the Atlantic. 1,528 people went into the frigid waters of the Atlantic. John Harper was a pastor. He put his only daughter on a lifeboat and was seen frantically swimming 
the people in the water, hoping to lead them to Jesus before the hypothermia became fatal and took their lives. Reverend Harper swam up to one young man who had climbed up onto a piece of debris. He asked him between breaths, are you saved? The young man replied that he was not. Reverend Harper then tried to lead him to faith in Christ, only to have the young man who was nearly in shock reply no. And John Harper took off his own life jacket and threw it to the man and said, here then, you need this more than I do. And swam away to other people. A few minutes later, he swam back to the young man and succeeded to lead him to faith in Jesus Christ. Of the 1,528 people that went into the waters that night, six were rescued by lifeboats. One of them was this young man on the debris. Four years later at a survivor's meeting, this young man stood up and in tears recounted how John Harper had tried to swim back to help other people because of the intense cold. He'd grown too weak to swim. His last words before going under the frigid water himself were believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Does Hollywood remember this man? Not at all. This servant of God did what he had to do while other people were trying desperately to deal with their hopeless situation. John Harper gave up his life so that others could be saved. He knew what it meant to live his life in obedience to God's calling. Now to be sure, that young man realized after he said, no way, I don't want that. He realized one minute later that he was about to breathe his last breath. And he listened and he gives a testimony that he was saved by the grace of God. We don't know when our last breath is coming, but it's coming for every single one of us. Probably before we think it'll come. But the Bible says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You can be saved today not by trying but by trusting in what Christ has done for you. And I don't know your neighbors I only know mine. But God has brought me to the place where I pray for them daily because I want them to know what it means to be born again. I may not be the person who gets to do that for them, but I'm having a part in that by saying, God, would you work in this person's heart? And do it, do it through my life as I come alongside of him. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the work at the cross. 
where he bore my sins in his own body there. And one day, as a boy of nine years old, I trusted what Jesus did for me and became a child of God. And you're not through with me. You continue to work in my life. And I'm thankful. I thank you for saving any person in this room who's cried out to you today. Any person listening to the radio who said, I need Jesus. I can't get this together myself. And Jesus has already paid the price for it. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for grace. Thank you for Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. Would you please stand and close in singing with us and we sing this reminder of a song of how powerful our God is even despite our weakness. <laughs> 